me. Here is Jamie. Hello, Jamie. I am here. Yeah. Cool. I am just singing your praises and um, saying my gratitude for um, you taking over, um, uh, chairing and moderating the call last week and your approach to it. So um, as, as we discussed at the docs meeting, I'm hoping I can coerce you into doing that in an ongoing way and taking it the reins again today. This is my role um, I'm in, in the world these days. I am trying to replace myself everywhere I can. Um, so um, especially if we can get external non-Red Hatters too. So that would be wonderful. So with that said, I'm just going to share my screen for a minute. So if people don't have the details, I'm going to put the, the screen here for where things are um, in the GitHub OpenShift community projects thing here, um, planning page in, in GitHub. But um, what we need to be able to do is get Jamie access to add stuff and take stuff away from here. Um, and we don't have that yet, so I'll, I'll make see if I can make that happen or move it into the OKD um, repo, um, the OKD.io repo, where we do have um, control over who has access to stuff and can easily add um, external people to. So that might be a way to do the, this. But um, I'm going to stop talking um, and I'm going to stop sharing. Um, ask Jamie to take over the reins and um, drive this meeting. Excellent. Well, welcome everybody. So the first thing I want to do, um, since we're here and there are 12 people on the call, I wanted to um, see if there are any new folks that wanted to introduce themselves uh, who maybe haven't been to the meetings before. Um, uh, or say something in the chat also. Feel free to say something in the chat if you're new and haven't been to the meetings before. Um, and maybe while folks are uh, getting situated, I'm Jamie McGarry. I'm from the University of Michigan. Diane, you've already introduced yourself, or maybe you should for people who are new to the call. Yes, uh, I'm uh, the Director of Community Development for the um, Cloud Platform BU over here at Red Hat and um, have been driving behind OpenShift and Origin and OKD for the past seven years. It's time to give the reins away. Okay, and uh, we see Dusty's in the chat. Uh, and of course, he's uh, working with uh, Timothy on Fedora Core OS. Uh, Vadim, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Um, I collect raw products and work for Red Hat and fix various issues related to OKD and uh, upgrades in general. Great. Does anyone else want to chime in real quick? Say a little bit about yourself. Hey, so, hey, I'm Timothée Ravier. I work on the Chorus team, uh, like, <coughs> and uh, so uh, I do most of the, well, I work on the, the, the Chorus team, uh, does a lot of the work on, on Fedora Chorus, which is underlying the OKD platform. Mike, you want to say hi and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Michael. Hi, Michael. I'm a technical writer with the OpenShift team. Excellent. All right. Well, it seems like we've gotten some introductions out of the way, and folks should feel free uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, see, Mohammed uh, said hello. Um, folks should feel free to say hi or introduce themselves in the chat, ask any questions and whatnot. So let's get started with our usual update from Vadim about latest and greatest things happening that we should know about. Um, right. So last weekend we released another stable cut from 4.7. Uh, the most notable about this release is that it has a new signature uh, GPG keys. Unfortunately, our previous ones have expired. So if you want to update this version, you would have to force update and skip the verification of the keys. But uh, from now on, for the next two years, uh, we should be covered on this situation. Um, Along with 4.7 stable release, there is also a new release candidate for OKD 4.8. I encourage everyone to have a look, um, and uh, we're waiting for feedback on that. The most notable change um, from 4.7 is a new way we build machine OS content. Um, so no longer uh, you're required to use a specific Fedora OS version, and um, 
OS extensions are no longer used. All of the RPMs are already baked in uh, the OS content. If uh, this way of building it is proven stable and reliable, we will also uh, copy that to 4.7, and uh, we would no longer have to use a, a fixed version of Fedora Core OS. Um, and uh, we don't have any particular plans yet when to use OKD 4.8 as a stable version. Uh, first of all, we don't have sufficient feedback. Second of all, OCP is still in uh, so-called feature freeze, not code freeze. So um, the early testing would be very appreciated, but uh, we still have a couple of weeks until we could start discussing which version is more stable. Um, I believe that's all from the technical part. Um, on my list, I also have uh, an item to contact Daniel Messer about the OKD specific uh, catalog. I don't think there's been much progress on that, so I'll ping them and see um, if there's been uh, any use. Um, I think that's all I've got for today. Are there any I questions have... for Vid Oh, sorry, go ahead, Diane. I have, I have a quick question. Um, the, um, the Ansible team, Timothy Afnil, had um, some questions about the um, moving the OKD um, community stuff from Ansible, their playbooks. Did that get, re get completed or is that still in limbo? No, I think they're still discussing if they want an entirely new repo, if they want to fork, or if they want to archive the previous one. Um, but in the end, that shouldn't affect the community, really. It's just a matter of, um, right. well, wh wh where it lands, the code remains the same anyway. Thanks. Any other questions for Vadim in regards to what he just laid out? Uh, yeah, Vadim, the uh, vSphere failures, were those IPI or UPI or both for the 4.8? In CI, there is, mm -hmm. yeah, there is a common problem for all vSphere clusters there. Um, the main problem is that our samples are still using Docker Hub. Uh, so we pull in CentOS 8, issues and the most common failing test there is that it cannot fetch all of them because uh, our external IPs are being blocked by Docker Hub. Unfortunately, the fix for this is pretty complex. Uh, ideally, we would convince the uh, software co collections work to mirror all the images to Quay, update all the image streams in their um, uh, in their repos, and there's like 20 of them. And then it would be picked up by samples operator and we would have this updated. Uh, the short-term fix is that we could probably install some kind of a proxy or a mirror for those releases, but that would complicate CI a bit. Um, we would be working with our infra team to fix it up, but um, I don't think it's easy to achieve. Um, so we would have to live with that for some time. The most problematic issue I see right now in 4.8 is that upgrade tests in 4.8 are mysteriously broken. Uh, we'll also be looking into that, but uh, in my manual test, things have been working fine, so I'd be very interested for some results from the field. Thanks. Any other questions for Vadim? All right, Thank let's you, move Vadim. on to, oh, yeah, thanks, Vadim. All right, let's move on to uh, some updates from the Fedora Core OS uh, side of the house. Dusty or Timothy, do you want to fill us in on anything that you think might be relevant? Yeah, so what the, the current uh, news on this side is that we just move uh, Fedora Core stable to Fedora 34, the rebase was uh, the, the, the initial base app in testing and now it's in, it's in stable. Uh, so it should be, well, I don't think they have, we have any major issue uh, right now with this one. I don't, I don't even get, um, we didn't get any from the tracker. 
Uh, the Podman issues have been resolved, as far as I understood. So we should, should be good. Um, so rather smooth move to Fedora 34 for now. This this one, so this one does not come with the C groups V2 change right now. It's coming up. This one, the, this specific change is coming in the next testing release that will happen approximately in two weeks. Um, and uh, yeah, but this one I think is covered too by the changes uh, in OKD. So that should be fairly uh, transparent for now because I don't think OKD would be switching to C group V2 right now. But that's a different issue. Um, so yeah, that's I guess that's it from me uh, on the Fedora Cores side. Um, the counting work has been fully announced everywhere. So. Okay. Does anyone have any questions uh, about the Fedora Core OS side of the house? Okay. I missed everything, but I assume it was fantastic. It was fantastic, but I'm sure you would have found something to criticize. Uh, let's see. I mean, I'm just happy we're moving to secret I'm the moderator. V2. I'm not supposed to say stuff like that. Hi, yeah, me. it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I assume we're moving to secret V2 now, so that makes me happy. Um, yeah, uh, it's uh, about, about to land, so it'll be in testing next week and then uh, stable two weeks after. Uh, for existing nodes, they're not migrated, um, but there will be a nice little banner that says, hey, you're on C groups V1, you might want to run this command to uh, switch up. The the problem there is like, you know, if there are any compatibility issues with people's applications, we don't want an automated, automated upgrade to break them. Uh, so we're trying to balance things there. But for newly deployed nodes, they will be on C groups V2 by default. If you would like to stay on C groups B1, you'll have to basically uh, add a kernel argument to keep your system that way. Uh, Ignition just did land support for actually changing kernel arguments, uh, which is nice. So you'll be able to, uh, soon enough, you'll be able to write a butane config that says, hey, this kernel argument should exist on the command line, and Ignition will apply that for you. Um, so that's kind of a nice recent change. I don't know if it really helps OKD much, but uh, it you know it might be able to be leveraged by OKD at some point if uh, that's something that's needed. And any other questions regarding Fedora Core OS? All right, then let's move on to the uh, discussion section, reviewing the discussion section. Um, there was a, a discussion item put in 12 days ago, and for folks, I'll put this in the link for folks that don't know where this is. This is the new discussion section, and folks have been using this for ideas and also for uh, bugs or issues that they come across. Diane, did you have something? Sorry. Yeah, I was going to ask you maybe if you could share your screen and just um, show that on the screen for people who are watching this as it's recorded. Absolutely. Second here. Ah, so for me to do that, I'd have to quit and reopen. Let me rejoin real quick. Ah, well, no, you, yeah. Yep, it's up to you. Or if someone else wants to share their screen with it, that would be. Why don't I share uh, my screen well for, for this time around so you don't have to quit and keep talking? There we go. Sorry, new laptop. There we go. All right, great. So uh, the new item is uh, listing vSphere resources which are created uh, during IPI installation via GovC. For folks that don't know, uh, GovC or GoVC, depending, some folks will say it different ways, um, is the command line tool uh, to work with vSphere that's a, an open source project. And a lot of my stuff is based on it, a lot of my scripting and stuff like that. And so the question here was, uh, would it be convenient to or improve the user experience if all of the resources which were created were fetchable uh, via that? Yeah, I don't know. 
Um, Vadim, did you ever find out, or do you know if there was like a list of resources that get created, or if there's an available list in regards to the installer? No, it's install? it's handled internally in the installer, but all I know is that it's supposed to tag all of them with your cluster name, so that you could remove it, um, and you can that you can list them and remove them or or fix them if you. Something needs by, fixing. By tag. Like, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure at the extent of how many resources could be labeled. For instance, in AWS, you cannot label DNS zones. And we have specific um, applications which are cleaning up after our CI if it fails in the middle or we are actually making a bug and leaking something. So um, ideally, you would be able to list all of them by tag. If some resources are missing, it's a bug in the installer and it needs to be fixed because it's, well, it's plaguing all of our systems and it's pretty severe. Does anyone want to join me in um, doing some installs and querying on items created, looking for items created and making sure that they're all properly tagged? Um, are there any other vSphere folks on here that would like to join me in that task? It actually sounds like a worthy project because then we could put in bug reports on anything that's not getting tagged. Anyone else? Well, go ahead and put your name in the chat if you are interested, because um, I think I'm going to do that. Uh, basically, you know, start with a fresh um, uh, vSphere and then just see what gets created and make sure that that matches um, with what gets tagged. I was, Jamie, I was talking with this person when they were asking in chat about oh, yeah, right. this listing the resources with GovC. Um, and my, I seem to have the impression that they, what they were trying to do was like have a way to like audit what had been created or like during a failed creation, they wanted to go back through the vCenter or something like that and find everything. So I think, I think you're absolutely right. And what Vadim's saying is, is great. Like we, we should just enable you to be able to use OC to see like what, what was created, what was not, you know, just pull the tags that way. That would be a lot better. This also feeds into kind of some other things we have going on about, you know, tagging all resources that get created and whatnot. But I think you, your instinct was great there. Yeah. If, if people wanted to like just confirm what's created, that would be amazing. Excellent. Um, and Mike, if you find that, if you can scroll back when you get a chance, not necessarily right now, but find that discussion in the chat and link us to it, that might be helpful. Maybe just yeah, put it sure. in the actual discussion item uh, on the repo. That'd be awesome. Cool. All right. And uh, other discussion item was uh, upgrade failed 4.6 to 4.7. Doesn't look like anyone looked at that. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on here. I wouldn't even know. Um, this would be some serious debugging. But if anyone wants to take a, a whack at this, um, this is on uh, bare metal install on VMware. Uh, this is the most recent discussion item. So um, my time is limited at the moment in terms of VMware, VMware stuff the next couple days anyway. Um, now let's bounce over to the issues section of the repo. So, um, yeah, just to the left. There you go. Perfect. Thank you, Diane. Um, and anything you want to draw to our attention here or anything that, Vadim, that you think that folks could help out in troubleshooting or um, any other way that you could leverage the group to address some of these? Um, I think in CRC build issue is the most problematic right now. So we had a problem for some months to build a 4.7 based release of CRC. Um, Charo would have the details, but I'm thinking it was because we are using a different partition and the image he's spinning is small enough to make it build. So we were kicking this can down the road and uh, our stable build has expired because the kubelets uh, certificates are valid for six months only, meaning we have to rebuild the 4.6 image every six months at least. Um, so I'm thinking 
if I remember correctly, Charo has documented how to build CRC fully, so it would be a great exercise for the community how to build a CRC from 4.6 or ideally uh, 4.7. That would be great. And um, that would really relieve us uh, and Charo in particular with uh, official build of CRC, which we would post, and this issue would be resolved probably. And um, do we have anyone on the call that uh, would have an interest in that? Uh, taking a look at that, giving it a shot. All right, put your name in the chat or send an email out on the working group email list uh, if you're interested. Uh, and we'll um, try to leverage the group as much as we can to get some of these uh, taken care of. So I, um, I was just—I know Charo's uh, not on the on the call today, so that so we need to get him added to um, the group, um, the repo, so that he can do that um, and um, figure out the, the OKD landing page there um, and get that updated too as well. So those those will be two things, and I'll, I'll take a look at. Um, being how I can get that facilitated. Yeah, and we'll get a link to Charles. I don't have uh, the link to his document, his CRC document, but we'll find that and then put that out over the email list um, so that folks have that handy. Um, uh, anything else, Vadim, that stands out that uh, you'd like us to leverage uh, the group for? No, I don't think we have anything else easy to start with. Most issues that are related to our infra and moving away from Docker Hub is a titanic task, but um, working with SCO folks and establishing contact with them at least uh, would be very, very useful because we barely have any. Okay. So I, I wanted to ask Jamie um, a question about, we talked at the docs meeting last week about doing some pair review slash programming of the docs. Um, is that something that um, you think we should add as a discussion item here? Is that a way to keep track of that? Um, or do you want to keep sure. that separate? Yeah, that, I think well, that I, would I, be. I, I think we can add it here. Um, you know, there's a couple of ongoing things that are sort of between uh, the groups. So yeah, we could definitely do that. In the, I, I don't see um, Mustafa on um, on the call at the moment, so now that I've brought it up, um, I'll, I'll just do a little update on um, the conversation that we had. And, and I know Bruce and Jamie were both there last week as well um, at the docs meeting. And um, there's a if, for those of you who don't know, there's a group of new Red Hatters onboarding um, who are going to be coming through um, the OKD working group as part of their onboarding process in the engineering team. Um, and Mustafa is the first guinea pig of that group. Um, and he's been on most of the calls except this week, so I'm not quite sure where he is today. Um, but um, we had a conversation about um, doing uh, some pair reviewing or pair programming approach to reviewing the docs. So taking one person, um, in this instance, we um, were thinking Bruce Link and Mustafa, who's new to it, hasn't really done a lot of deploying of OKD, um, and reviewing uh, the OK, docs.okd.io um, and testing out the workflow um, of how that pair programming would work. Um, and I say pair programming, pair reviewing, um, and then how we interact with the docs team. So we have one red hatter in each of the pair, which would be Mustafa um, in this instance, and work out that workflow. And then once they did, you know, I, I'm not sure they're going to do all of the docs.okd.io, but like a section and figure out what that is, is to replicate that um, in like we did for the hackathon on testing and deploying and having, taking each of the section of the docs and basically pair programming with a red hatter and an external person who's got some experience in it and reviewing the docs and doing, um, using link, uh, not LinkedIn, hop in. Um, again, to do something um, similar to that. So the first stage would be to, to do one pairing, um, figure out what the workflow was, and then document that, and then host um, probably not a Saturday in the summer, but a day in the, an afternoon in the summer, or let people do them individually at their own pair, you know, scheduling 
um, of their their time and effort um, and then work through the docs that way and that would be one of the onboarding tasks for all of these newbies to OKD and anyone else who wanted to participate um, as well so that could help us like with the CRC docs that uh, Charo has done getting those up to speed because uh, what we've all seen in the docs.okd.io section is that it is just a, a rebuild from the OCP archives stuff and often there are little things that are tweaks for what we're doing that aren't getting um, integrated into that flow so part of that is um, one of the things that, that I'd like to see if we can't get moving forward and, and Mustafa I did talk to him Bruce he's game um, I did not send an email out because um, I knew you were at Victoria Day yesterday um, so uh, once and you're still in school so school should be ending so once school ends for you and you've finished all your grading um, I'd like to set up that first event um, and if anyone else is interested in doing something like this side by side with a Red Hatter um, the end of this week good new, good to know um, we'd like just to kind of use that to onboard folks and if there's an area of the docs that people think um, it ne really needs focusing on um, raise your hand or put a discussion section in there um, and we'll take that on um, and pair somebody up with you to do work through it because I think you need one red hatter on there to have the interaction with the docs team for the docs.okd.io but you may not need that for um, for other chunks like this that's on okd.io did I catch that right, Jamie, Bruce? Other things you want to add? Good. I have a question about this. This may be better for the docs meeting, but I'm just curious because, like, I would imagine that the OKD docs, we're going to keep updating them every time a new release comes out in the same way that the OCP docs are. But mm -hmm. I'm curious, was there any thought about, like, should do the OKD docs exist as a change set on top of the OCP docs. Yeah. Because like it seems yeah. like it's gonna be a ton of material to go through every time OCP docs get updated. Yeah. So so that's the workflow we have to figure out. That's why I wanted to do one pair first, get someone from the docs team. And I don't know, Michael B, you're on here. I think you I heard you said you were a technical writer. Are you on the docs team, Michael B? Yes, yes I am. All right. So I would love it if next Tuesday you could come to the docs meeting, which is the same time, same place as this, and um, we can kind of figure out what the work, how, how you want to be informed of the things that they want to change, those kinds of little details. Um, and that would be really helpful for us because sure. we, we have resources and Larry just stepped up um, and said, yeah, I'll do the vSphere stuff. Um, everybody, you know, at just each of these things. And that way, I think once we know what the overlay is, just for the docs.okd.io, Part of the documentation set then hopefully each time we rebuild a new release those patches get applied properly so michael doesn't have to go in and handhold them and all that so um that's that's my thought process but michael um chime in now or next week and um what it would be maybe it's a three-way a trio not just a pair it's a trio um, with one person from docs one red hat engineer and one external person who's you know an expert in an area um, or has deployed in an area um, and use the docs actually um, from an external point of view that trio um, might be what we need um, to, to kick off the first one because you know, there are lots of processes for getting the documentation updated. And I know the person that we had a year ago working with us on docs um, has left left the farm, um, gone to another farm. So um, it, that's what we're, we're missing. Now, that sounds good. Just let me know how I can help out. Yeah, same, same date, time, but oh. next Tuesday, just come to this session. Um, and then I was going to ask um, Mike McEwen um, where, if at all, anything has happened with the guides and moving them over, or if you're just as busy as I am and nothing has happened. Uh, well, I, you know, I don't want to speculate at your busyness or my busyness, but um, no, I, I kind of backed off because I thought I thought you were going to take a look at it. But if you're not having time, like, you know, we got a long weekend coming up. I can I can take another look at making a PR there. 
If you could make a PR, that would be great because, yeah, no, I have. Yeah, I mean, I just didn't, I just didn't go through with it because I thought it, last you and I talked, I thought you were going to take a look at it, so I just didn't get any deeper into understanding that like uh, Jekyllish uh-huh. bo- blogging platform that's there. I forget, I forget what it's called. Yeah, I, I think in the person who can. Um, the community person who could help out with that, who understands the back back end, is Joseph Meyer from Rody and Schwartz, who's not on this call. So I'm going to volunteer him to help you with that. Um, so reach out to him because he didn't show, so he gets volunteered. And yeah, I mean, I think it's just one of those situations where I just I need to spend I just need to sit down and spend a couple hours with it and just kind of figure out what's going on. It, it once once I wrap my head around it, I should be able just to copy those docs over. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, it's not bad. And there are a couple new blogs and um, that went out, um, very quick ones, about one with Joseph's um, video from the last KubeCon that he did a nice talk on, and the other one with the office hours, um, and I think I did them right, or they're public. Um, and the other thing that I have is if anyone's interested in it, um, the video will go up later today, hopefully. Um, the cross-plane operator needs to be tested on OKD. Um, and that's just been released. And just prior to this meeting, I just did a um, review, uh, a briefing on that. And there is a blog post on OpenShift.com um, that Krish Chowdhury um, wrote. Um, that's a, yeah, it might be on Developer.com. I'll find the link and post it um, to the group. But if anybody would like to, they they're looking for some feedback on that um, cross-plane operator and making sure that it works with OKD and vanilla Kubernetes as, or any other kind of Kubernetes as well. But that's um, been the big push, and I think they have it for. They've done a lot of testing on AWS, so the safe bet might be testing the cross-plane operator on um, AWS OKD. Well, it might be the easy path just to make sure everything works. And then I'm going to zip it and let Jamie go back to it. So uh, the um, link that I just posted uh, in the panel is to an older discussion that's ongoing. Uh, we talked about this last week. This will be something that the docs group is going to tackle, which is um, clarifying the community support model, like what that actually means. And um, in essence, I'm going to move a little bit because there's some construction happening near me. Um, in essence, the issue is that we want to make sure that when people look for help, that they're not reaching out directly to a random employee necessarily uh, or picking one individual person, that in fact they're asking the community for support and helping to build community resources. And this is spawned out of uh, multiple situations of folks reaching out to Red Hat employees or um, sort of reaching out to individuals or having certain expectations in terms of time and resources that aren't really, don't align with the model that we have uh, for support. So the docs group will be talking about this. Um, what we will need from the community at large is any place where you think that this language would be appropriate to, to put any type of communications, um, the website, blog, in, in any of the repositories, any place where you think that this language would be helpful, uh, please let us know, like put a, a comment in the discussion thread there. Um, that would be super helpful. We're gonna come up with the language within the docs group, I think. Um, and if anyone wants to chip in on that, we'll probably be doing that, like adding to this thread with that language. Um, any questions or comments on that? Any thoughts? Yeah, Diane actually. Hold on, we got three no, three people. Yeah. I think Diane yes. was first, then Mike, and then whoever the third person was, sorry. That was three. Oh, uh, okay. So, I don't know, who's going first? Uh, let's do it in order of people, Mike, then Sri, then Diane, because Diane seems to be having mic problems here. Oh, I was just going to say, like, what, yeah, can we just put this in a giant banner across, like, docs.okd.io? <laughs> uh, yeah. No, sorry about the, the, mic, the mic issue. Um, I think there's some um, good verbiage on a couple of other open source community sites that we can lift and, and reshape as well, then I'll try and find um, that that could help. 
put those in the discussion thread. Yeah. That would be awesome, Diane. Uh, Shri. Yeah, I was thinking specifically in the case of the Slack channels, like um, maybe it would be possible to have Slackbot say something to people when they first join. Like, hey, if you're using OKD, maybe ping, and we set up a group with, you know, community members who want to be involved with it, just to, like an at OKD or something, so that they can ping that instead of ping a Red Hat employee directly, or someone that they have seen in a GitHub issue, which I think is more often what's happening. Right, yeah. So that's, I don't know uh, who has control over, do we have control to be able to do that uh, with, the, with the Slack bots there? Um, on the, the Kubernetes channel, we don't have control yeah. um, too much. Um, I can reach out and see um, if we can slightly modify the OpenShift dev one with a, you know, a reference to OKD. Um, I, I know Amy and the other managers there, so maybe we can get something added there. Um, I'll see. Let me add, add that to my to-do list today. That would be fantastic. I think Shri had a nice idea in there too. Like, it, in addition to the cluster bot, like having a, having an alias for like a group of people who want to volunteer to be the OKD support team or whatever. Like, if there was a, yeah, if there was a group of community members, you know. But I mean, if there were a group of community members who were willing to volunteer for that kind of stuff, say like, well, if, if someone pings this, um, you know, this alias, then these people will get alerted. They might respond. I don't, I don't know if that's something people would be interested in or not. Yeah. It's not That's like it. an obligation or anything, but I know there are a few no, of right. us. Yeah, yeah uh, there are a few of us who you know hang around in there and respond to people's threads. So just formalizing that ad hoc arrangement a tiny bit. Yeah, totally. No, I mean, yeah, like formalizing it a little bit, or even like giving someone, you know, having a banner in there that just says like, "Look, if you're looking for help, ping this." You know. Yeah. Let me ask what's what's possible. The art of the possible. Okay. Excellent. Anyone else have comments or questions on this topic? All right. Uh, and then the other one, which sort of ties into this, is um, we had talked with Vadim at the last meeting about coming up with like a list of like the group, the community coming up with a, a sort of a quick little guide to how to troubleshoot yourself an OKD install. Um, you know, in addition to the little bit of stuff that's that's in the official OKD docs. Um, and I know Vadim was gonna come up with a list of things that he thought we should sort of um, fill out, provide more details on in terms of install stuff based on sort of common issues that he sees um, and whatnot. Um, Vadim, did you have anything you wanted to, to chime in on that? Uh, um, I don't think I had any progress on the actual implementation, but I'm thinking we could start with a markdown in the repo, get it reviewed, and uh, slowly iterate from here, maybe making a video or a full-blown blog post. Um, I could take a look into this this week, hopefully. Um, if I forget, please do remind me to do that. That's very important, actually. Yes, uh, and we want to be mindful of your time, so the goal would be not to put this on you, uh, but you know, just the few ideas that you can provide that you think are, are uh, pain points, basically, for someone doing an install that you've seen, and then we can do all the legwork of, of filling that out um, and putting in details and stuff. Right, yeah, I was just thinking yeah. we should involve our architects because that list would also be very useful internally. Um, right and make it more generic to support various platforms um, and effectively pass it to the installer team to have this uh, documentation completed. Um, so I'm thinking I'll start with my own notes, then we'll pass it to architects and the community and we'll work with that and it would land, in the end, it would land in the installer repo as a developer documentation. That would be fantastic. Thank you, Vadim. This would be uh, cool to. Oh, sorry, I was gonna. I don't. Do you want us raising hands or something, Jamie? Do you? No, no, no. That's fine. That's fine. No, no. Oh, okay. No, um, I just wanted to, yeah, kind of tailgate on what Vadim was saying there. Like, are you know, 
it would be cool to collect some of these resources together, like because our team has also been trying to create troubleshooting docs for our components. So we have like a machine API troubleshooting guide. Um, we have a machine health check troubleshooting guide that's in the works and like a cluster auto scaler uh, troubleshooting guide planned as well. So like the, and it's similar to what Vadim's talking about. We've been putting these in the repositories where the code lives. So like, it'd be kind of cool at some point to get like, you know, have one page with all these troubleshooting guides like in one place or something like that. Any other thoughts dumb on question. That? Is oh, yeah. there um, anything out there like that just shows like a, a schematic or a, or a diagram of all the various OKD components? There, there's, uh, there's some stuff out there for base Kubernetes, but OpenShift has a whole bunch of stuff on top of it. That would be helpful to, to put there just so people have an idea of how to orient themselves or what could be the cause of their issue. That sounds like a great idea. I'd be happy to contribute to that. I don't, I don't think we have an exhausting list for this, but if you look into the release info payload, that's the list of components included in, in the release payload. It doesn't explain how do they in, how do they work together? Because, well, th this thing changes every release, and I don't think we can keep it updated every single time. But um, just to give you an idea of what can possibly go wrong, it could be networking, it could be monitoring, um, it's, um, it could be useful. And uh, it also points you to a particular commit it was built from. So you can find out which repo is it built from. And hopefully this repo would have a troubleshooting guide or some developer documentation. I think that's what we have for now. And um, probably, I, I mean, we, we can work with architects to improve that, but I think that's the best we have for now. From a more architectural standpoint, not just from the uh, component like operator standpoint, because I totally like Shri, what you're talking about makes complete sense. Like I've I've actually gone through like every operator and tried to put piece this together for myself, and it is not it is not an easy task. Um, but I had been talking with another Red Hatter internally, um, Fabiano Franz for the other Red Hatters here, when we had first set up that guides and deployment uh, repo. He and I had kind of talked about he was working on a project to generate architecture diagrams of OpenShift clusters based on like, I think Terraform or something. So like he was generating these really cool diagrams that would show you like topologically how your cluster was laid out and where each component was and like, you know, how these things fit together. Um, we never got to the point, he was talking about generating some documents that he was gonna contribute to that uh, OKD, you know, deployment guides repo, but we never got to the point where he was generating them. I could always go back and ask him, like, if we, if he made any progress there, because that would be, I thought the diagrams he was creating were really instructional in terms of, like, just seeing how your cluster is laid out. Very cool. Just any other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. That's, like, a major thing. How do we get people acclimated to just this? environment, what components are in their stack that aren't in other, other people's because it deploys to so many different places. Everybody needs, yes, I You're cutting out a lot, Sri. I got Am like I? one, That's six words. That's unfortunate. Come here, microphone. No, I was just saying, it just to help onboard people who are perhaps new to OKD in particular, or who might even have experience with Kubernetes, because very few, like there are maybe three things on this list that could conceivably call it, be called like, oh yeah, I recognize that from a vanilla Kubernetes, you know, cube proxy, woohoo, I know, I know what that is. And then everything else on top of it is just like, who knows? So, yeah. I mean, what did you say about it? Really what Vadim said about changing and whatnot between releases, that, that's like gonna be totally, you know, we're adding more operators in the next release, you know? So I mean, like it's, <laughs> it's just not, it's not gonna get any better like anytime soon, I don't yep. think. All the more reason to maybe start now, I don't know. 
I'm, I'd be totally willing to contribute, or at least write down what I have figured out about what's on top, all the sort of open OKD or OpenShift specific value add stuff. Um, I, but I'm sure I've gotten about half of it wrong simply because I don't know. How about if, um, Shri, if you, if you took a stab at that, um, and because I'm, I'm just sort of listening in the background, but I'm also thinking the work that, um, that Bruce did around the taxonomy for things to watch out for when you're installing, that this diagram or this piece, um, all of the things in his taxonomy should have a, an entry point in this diagram or this list at some point. So that kind of is this, to me, it's the same work effort. Um, uh, there are tons of OCP um, diagrams out there um, in all the product marketing speaking slide decks I've seen over the years. I'm not sure, Vadim, if you've ever seen one that was actually really engineering useful. Um, so that, which is what I would I've seen, I've seen a bunch and all of them are outdated. They have been outdated when they were created. Yeah, yeah. they're almost outdated yeah, you know, as soon as you build it. So that's, that's the yeah. problem. So, um, yeah. Like a sort of related thing, Diane, uh, is that, uh, you know, whenever I sort of take five minutes just for the heck of it and look for a, uh, what's the difference between, you know, OCP slash OKD slash Kubernetes, it's very fuzzy. Uh, it's very, it is fuzzy. And, and uh, you know, so we have all these o OCP OKD specific components. You think that you could make a bit of a clearer statement from a marketing standpoint. You'd think, um, you'd think, um, and, and I have asked. Um, there, there is, there is some marketees around that um, on the OpenShift.com site in different places. It's not really explicitly clear um, often, um, even in my humble opinion. Um, and I'm inside the inside the beasts. Um, I, th I think it is something that we need to clarify in the docs a little bit better. Um, beyond just, you know, this is community supported and it runs on Fedora Core OS. I mean, there's, there's some other things that are, are a little bit different. Um, but so there's, there's such a strong message uh, that's repeated over and over and over again that uh, OCP is just Kubernetes. And, mm. I, and I, guess, I guess the idea is don't be afraid. If you've heard of Kubernetes, you can use this as well. Yeah. And okay, I could understand that part of it, but it's not the whole story. I I think part of the problem here, Bruce, is like when you ask that question, like what you know, like how does OpenShift relate to Kubernetes? You're kind of entering a propaganda zone too, right? Because right, like on exactly. one hand, there's Red Hat's marketing and propaganda. There's Red Hat's competitors propaganda and marketing, and then there's like all these other opinion there's pieces. There's the truth that's out. somewhere in the middle. Well, yeah, and then there's the truth, right? But like, so for a while, the messaging was, yeah, OpenShift is Kubernetes, because like from a marketing perspective, you know, we didn't want to scare people who were like, well, OpenShift is like, you know, and you get locked into this specific type of Kubernetes, right? So that, that was a message for a while, but like now it's like, well, how do we differentiate OpenShift from Kubernetes? What, is, what does OpenShift add? How do we enumerate that? And I see salespeople struggle internally to figure out like the best way to talk about this messaging. So like, I, I agree with your, with your, uh, what you're saying, like we should own that message and have it somewhere on the OKD site. So people don't have to rely on, you know, the propaganda and the FUD and whatever else is out there, but it's like so, a difficult question to answer. Sometimes. Right. Well, maybe everybody's so stuck that's in the two to three transition. So that's, in, that's an interesting thing that we're talking about because Sri and I have actually been doing this kind of differentiated messaging internally because I think at this point I, I count like six, seven, maybe eight different Kubernetes deployments internally, and they're all different with different things. And, and and so everybody's like got a different set of opinions, and that means they have a different set of components on top of the base, and they're all somewhat good and somewhat bad. And it's just and been such a mess. Yeah, the, the best been, thing, the, been... yeah, the best thing that I could ever come up with that people um, wouldn't get all um, up and whatever um, with me was was calling um, OKD the Kubernetes distribution that powers OpenShift. 
And that was as close as I could get to something unopinionated, but it doesn't do. I mean, I made that phrase up. So, you know, blame me for that. <laughs> Um, and so the way that we've we've messaged it internally is that OKD is the uh, is essentially the OpenShift Kubernetes distribution, uh, and that and that allow and we and we because we're deliberately saying Kubernetes distribution, we get to explain yeah. this in the same context that we do Linux distributions, which is an opinionated assemblage of components that are integrated and connected together in such a way where the user experience is coherent and usable. And like we have much more detailed stuff internally um, that we've used about messaging around OKD versus other options that we've also been using for promoting the usage of OKD and OpenShift and all that stuff. Yeah. That it's um, been, I think it took us a long time to it. land on the word distribution as well. But that's the first thing that we've tried that people can analogize in their head that sticks. Yeah. So yeah. I want to so let's just say you have Microlist, that's the SUSE distribution, and then you have OKD and OpenShift, that's the Red Hat RHEL distribution. You know, it's Red Hat's opinions, it's SUSE's opinions, it's Red Hat's tooling, it's SUSE's tooling. It's you know right. uh, whoever else is vanilla Kubernetes is basically the Arch Linux or Slackware of Kubernetes distribution. I think we so can let's, kind of likened it to on. Slackware hold because. On. Because let's you know, let's, let's pull it. back a little bit. Let's pull back a little bit because we have uh, seven minutes left and there was actually a question in the chat and I want to be sure that we get to it. So I think it's a good question um, about uh, CI. Do we have our CI CD documented? There is on the front page uh, on the readme, there's a little section that talks about the release process and whatnot, but I don't know of anything else uh, Vadim, do you know of anything else um, that actually lays out the CI process for OKD? Um, yes. Um, surprisingly, it's very. There are a bunch of technical documentation about how to how to work with our CI because, well, this is the internal thing. The main idea is that uh, OKD contains all you need to start up a cluster. Your only choice here is effectively the starting image, which we will um, which we will fix also later. And what our CI does is that it follows the book and does that um, every time we make a new release. Um, to answer the, the question directly, uh, the Fedora CoreOS and OKD components are being built by respective um, repositories. The repository to hold our OKD flavor of Fedora Core OS is called OKD Machine OS. So every time we make a commit there or a pull request, our CI makes a new build for OKD and replaces the component in question with uh, the testing code. It builds the release and runs uh, a conformance end to end test. And if this change is acceptable, it will merge it, um, build a new image, and push it to the image stream. And from this image stream, we are building um, an official release on our release um, controller page, which is like a release page for all of our there. And if this so-called nightly build is stable enough, we declare it stable and move it, uh, mirror it to Quay and move it to for stable link. Um, so we have very detailed explanation of how the eye can be configured, how it works. I don't think we have a great documentation about release controller. Um, I think we should file a bug and we could ask the, our infra folks to describe some more the inner workings of this because that one's also very interesting. Um, we have to we have to specify that everything is done in CI. The only decision we do is to mirror um, files to the mirror the stable release to Quay, and that's something in the works also to avoid doing them manually. So that our only interaction with that would be just uh, one command to give it a special annotation so that it would be mirrored and put to um, Quay 
and put in the fourth stable channel. Uh, let me find if I have a documentation about CI, but I don't think we have a great documentation about uh, release control, really. Let's file a bug so that we could track it and add it to the OKD repo. That'd be fantastic, Vadim. Okay, we have four minutes left, and so are there any last questions or comments about anything OKD related uh, that we can deal with in the next three minutes? I want to be mindful of people's time always. Any other questions, comments, anything you want to bring to the table before we uh, adjourn? All right. Sounds like we've got everything we need. And, you know, in terms of that discussion that was going in terms of, uh, um, you know, communicating what OKD is, um, that's a great discussion. And I think that, you know, I wanted to pull it back to make sure we had enough time. But that can be carried on, I think, um, for sure. So please don't feel like that was uh, cutting it off in any way. Yeah. Not intentionally tend intended to do that. Yeah, I think Diane, did you have anything? Oh, no, I, I'm just going to say to Shree that if, if you want to take a stab at it, because and, and I'm really glad I hit the record button because I think um, uh, Neil articulated it very nicely there um, if, in a few words. Uh, I might try and go back and get the transcript of that. Um, and that would be wonderful um, to get that done because I think we, we do this internally, externally, across uh, communities. Uh, we really don't have a great way. I am really attached personally to calling it something distribution. We are not allowed to say what the letters OKD stand for legally. I think I've said that before in the meeting. Um, so we can't like, OKD does not stand for the OpenShift Kubernetes distribution. We, Red Hatters, cannot say that. Um, other people can t say whatever they damn please. Um, but, um, <laughs> And um, yeah, you could call it okay, Diane. That's all I care about, really. So um, that, 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 is, why call we it that. that is that is absolutely freaking hilarious and kind of depressing at the same time. Yeah. Well, uh, the CNCF and Linux Foundation own the Kubernetes trademark, um, and so you can't say. Yeah, you can't. That's why there it was is already licensed. It's uh, you can't you can't use Kubernetes in the name of a product or an open source project. You, that's why you see all the K8s's and the um, EKS's and the GK you know, OKEs and the you know everything. That is just the way the the world bounces. When Google donated it to um, the Linux Foundation and set up CNCF, they donated the trademark, and CNCF owns that brand. So um, yeah, it's an interesting world, but it also keeps us honest. It, it just makes it hard to message stuff. So um, hence why OKD has that, you know, the Kubernetes distribution that powers, you know, Red Hat's OpenShift. Um, and it's it's tough internally, and I'm just, and I'm going to take the last one minute. If you think about how many different flavors of OpenShift there are, it's not just OCP anymore. Um, so, you know, it's, it's crazy. So anyways, thank you for a wonderful meeting, Jamie. Um, I'm so happy that you're willing to do this, and I love your backyard. Um, so we'll we'll meet again if Michael B. is here, if he can please join us for the um, next week's uh, docs meeting. We will flush out the workflow for pair documentation reviewing then as well. So thanks, thank everybody. You. Special thanks to Jamie.